My name's Aaron, and I'm here with Jared. Now, Jared, um, you're not mainstream LDS. What, what, what is your religious background? I'm fundamentalist. What? Um, I there's a lot of fundamentalist groups. Our uh, church called Church of Jesus Christ. So. Is it a, a pretty old group, new group, or? Well, our was founded in 1830. Joseph Smith. <laughs> who, who would be your present day prophet? Well, that's not something I want to throw out there. We'd like to protect him because of the persecution. Okay, is he well known? Uh, among fundamentalists. Okay, so what distinctively marks you from other fundamentalists? What's unique about your group's doctrines? Uh, well, we teach that um, the succession of the keys is probably the biggest thing where our lineage of the priesthood comes from. And now, uh, with the advent of the second declaration, I believe, the LDS Church in 1978, is where, where our, the split off comes from our church and the LDS Church. So you disagree with the um, blacks and the priesthood issue? Correct. And would you believe, uh, would you say that the blacks have the curse of Cain and they um, were less valiant in the pre-existence? Could you explain if that's your position? Yeah, it is. That's, that's pretty straightforward. Okay, so I said it right? Yeah. Okay. Um, how do you square that with the New Testament belief that we're all, in, for, those, for all those who are in Christ Jesus by faith, there's no s slave or free, you know, Jew or Gentile, there's kind of levels out all the different differences? Well, if you read um, the Bruce R. McConkie, I don't know if you're familiar with Bruce R. McConkie and the LDS Church, uh, before 1978, if you read all the stuff he teaches on it, we're straight along with everything. But post that, it's like all the views were all of a sudden changed. I mean, for whatever reason, they decided to, to go with that change. And now, um, with um, Brigham Young, he's pretty, he was pretty straightforward when he talked about um, that the, the seed of Cain could not have the priesthood until all of uh, the descendants of, of Abel had the opportunity to receive of that blessing. Now what would you say to a modern mainstream Mormon who says that the church only taught that as policy and not as doctrine? Or that they should go back and read Brigham Young's talks. <laughs> so you would say very clearly that the church taught the doctrine of the blacks and the priesthood and, and the, the accompanying pre-existence idea as de facto doctrine. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's no, not a question in my mind. Okay. So. okay so do you believe in Adam God? Yep. So how did you go back to Adam God belief? If, I mean, that was, that was the church dis distanced it's itself from that pretty quickly after Brigham not, died, didn't they? Not going back. We actually continued with it, actually. If you... Um, it's kind of hard to explain in like a two-minute little, little discussion, but what happened in back in, um, well, let's see, this, the original split from our church and the LDS church was in 1890 when the first declaration of um, plural marriage or polygamy or whatever term you want to use was saying, okay, the church is no longer going to live that. But there's two different organizations within the church. You have the organization of the priesthood and you have the organization of the church. And so... Very few Mormons realize that about the early Mormon church history, that the church was founded before the priesthood really took off. Right, so you have the priesthood and then you have the church itself. And so the priesthood actually continued with all the laws, including Adam-God doctrine, teaching that, teaching plural marriage, alongside. So it's like there was two organizations moving along together. LDS Church still had the priesthood. Wasn't the church contradicting the Adam-God doctrine for quite a while? Yeah, they were. Do you think they were doing that purposefully or just sort of deceptively or not ready for it in the public but will believe it in the private? Or I don't know. I, I wasn't there, so I don't want to speculate on why they were doing it. Uh, what's the last prophet you, uh, you, you esteem as being legit in the mainstream Mormon church? Um, well, you have Let's see who was right before Grant. <laughs> I think Grant was right there at the split off, because I don't, I don't believe that Grant was a true prophet. So you're not going as far as Joseph F. Smith, Joseph, Mr. Kimball, or Joseph Smith, Joseph Fielding Smith was a true prophet, but Joseph F. Smith wasn't. And I'm, I'm, I'm an idiot. I forget where Grant is in the whole, the um, timeline. 
I have it written down. That's why I have my book back. <laughs> but you acknowledge Joseph Fielding Smith as a true prophet. Now these guys, though, are, they're rejecting Adam God, are they not? No, they weren't. In the 1916 first presidency statement, remember that? I don't. Okay, so, <laughs> so, you, so in the Adam God, explain for us in your own words and thoughts, how does the Adam God stru st structure doctrine uh, identify Elohim, Jehovah, Michael? How, what do you mean? The naming conventions for who Elohim and Jehovah are were very different um, in the 1800s, were they not? Correct. They, right now, I believe they believe Jesus Christ is Jehovah and he is the God of the earth, which we believe he's the God of the earth, but not um, the only God like you have and Brigham Young's talk in Journal of Discourses, volume one, page 50 and 51, he, Brigham Young lay, lays it out pretty clearly that Adam is the God of this earth and the only God whom we have to do. And it also goes into it a little bit further. It just seems like in the, this is 1916 first presidency statement that James Talmadge has a big hand in, in getting out. Okay. And they say that Elohim is the father, Jehovah's Jesus, and they identify what it means for Jesus to be the Father. But it sounds like a big way for them to reject Adam God because Adam God had different naming conventions for who Jehovah and Elohim were. And, 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 they, and they were very public, if I remember correctly, with Joseph F. Smith and J James Talmadge that Adam is not the God we worship. Adam is a kind of God, you could say, they would say. But, I mean, so I'm, I'm just kind of curious seems like the early, you know, in the early 20th century, the church, you know, they, they, wanted, to get, they wanted to get rid of the Adam God, you know what I'm saying? The doctrine, yeah. they, it was a big problem for them. Their people were sending lots of letters to the first presidency. But. Yeah, they were, and it, I think it, they were just taking steps slowly from um, the beginning to where they just kind of slowly made some changes. And I think if they would, would have started right there in 1890 and made all the changes that they've had today, I mean, they would have, my opinion, they would have had a mass falling out of people saying, okay, well, there's all, this is obviously not the true church anymore, or there's so, so many changes, we've got to figure out where the truth really is. Okay, another topic, multiple mortal probations. Do you guys buy into that? Uh, no. They're, so you're definitely not TLC then, huh? No. <laughs> the, the, the only time when you after you receive your celestial glory, I guess, if you have that, you know, if you're a valiant here upon the earth and you are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, um, like as part of the Adam-God doctrine, um, uh, if you read in the scriptures and in talks of the early church uh, leaders, uh, such as Brigham Young, um, talks about how Adam came from another earth previous earth. He brought one of his celestial already resurrected wives, right? Right. So they were, at that point, they kept their first estate. They came, became gods. And now what they did is they came down upon this earth. So if you want to look at like they were lived two mortal lives because he was a god and then he became mortal again because he was an Adam. And now, like you said, he had his wife with him. And so now they're no longer you know, perfect, like they were in heaven, they had to go through that again to start and give their spirit children bodies here upon the earth. Now, and the same one who impregnated Mary was Adam. I mean, you know, I've read about the Adam God teaching. It's very clear to me that Brigham taught it and that most of his apostles signed off onto it. Orson seemed like he was stubborn about it. Yeah, but a little bit. But, you know, one of the... You know, they clarified that a little bit. In, uh, in their discussion. One thing that I'd love to just talk about for a minute is um, the mainstream church, the mainstream LDS church, does it really, do you really feel like it's making an attempt to reach out to you, to try to change your mind? Uh, well, when I was 17, my uncle is LDS mainstream and a lot of my close family are, and they did. And so your I, family did? Yeah, my family did. I took the missionary discussions and it was a little strange to me <laughs> as at that point I was searching and tr learning and, and trying to decide what religion I wanted to believe in and through the spirit I mean 
Not that they, did, they didn't bring a good spirit with them, but it wasn't the whole truth. It's like they had a little bit of the truth, but they didn't have the whole truth. And all they told me to do was read their Nephi and gain a witness of it, and that, um, which I already had done at, at that point. So I already told them I'll already read it, and they said, well, read it again. And I said, okay. I'll read. Very interesting for you, having a testimony of the Book of Mormon probably doesn't mean having a testimony of the mainstream church. Right, exactly. And that's the way they're taught to do, and that's the way they're taught to missionaries. So I was a little, little different case for him. And so at the end, I mean, at, at the time, their, their discussions were a little different. I think they had like seven lessons to go over, and then um, they would they would kind of move along. Obviously, I went through quite a bit faster than most people because I already had read the Book of Mormon and different things. And I already told them, well, I already have a testimony of it. And they said, well, read it again. And then our last meeting, um, they asked me, well, oh, before that, they told me to pray about the prophet, which is Kimball at the time. And, and I was like, okay, well, I'll pray about it. And so I didn't gain any kind of witness or anything of him being the prophet. And um, well, then they, when they were done, they said, well, do you want to be baptized? And I'm looking at them like, did you hear anything I said? And so I was just like, no, I don't want to be baptized. I assume and, uh, you do have a, what you would call a testimony of the current prophet that you have? Correct, yeah. Can you explain that testimony? Well, I, when I was a child, because I was actually born into the religion, religion I am in now, but I still had to find my own way. Um, through trials I brought upon myself, trials with our family, um, um, I had to figure it out and pray and kneel and fast and find out for myself what the truth really was. And that's what the scriptures tell us to do. So I felt like it was a good, uh, good way to figure out where the truth was, where the true keys were. And um, when I was a, small, a younger boy, I remembered how I sat and, in a meeting and listen to the prophet of God speak in that meeting and I was overcome with the spirit and it, it, over, it came on me so fully that I, I mean I could just feel this tingling all over my body and I actually started crying and at the time I mean I had, I had no idea why and I remembered that event and so that was so strong still even years later that that just bore witness to me of the truthfulness of the words that, that, that were coming out of this man's mouth. Um, back to that one question I have for you. Um, do you feel like the LDS Church beyond your own family is really trying to reach out to you? Do you think they've kind of forgotten about you? Or kind of want to pretend like you don't exist? You could probably already tell what I think by the way I'm asking the question, the tone, but tell me what you think. Well, I don't think they can missionary people like myself. I don't think it's possible because it would, the discussion would start going the other way around. I would start asking them questions and they, in my opinion, they would not be able to answer any of the questions that I had for the missionaries because there wouldn't be anything that they could say. I'm like, well, why did your prophet teach Adam God doctrine? Why did your prophet teach um, that, that the Canaanites weren't supposed to hold the, the priesthood until, you know, and then and on and on. I mean, you could... Now, are you guys practicing polygamy in your group, or...? Yes. Um, and I assume that Mormon missionaries try to avoid you guys? Um, <laughs> you, you could say that. <laughs> okay. Um, so, do you agree, well, do you think that the Book of Mormon teaches any false doctrines on the nature of God? That the Book of Mormon teaches false doctrines? Do you think the Book of Mormon teaches any false doctrines on the nature of God? I don't. No, it's true. I mean, just as Brigham Young, and uh, not Brigham Young, but Joseph Smith translated, uh, as long as another man hasn't changed it in some way, which I, I do uh, kind of remember a couple of changes that have been made since he, he's uh, brought it forth. So. so what if I told you the Book of Mormon seems to teach more of a born-again Christian view of God um, not so much a Mormon view of God, modern Mormon mainstream view of God, or fundamentalist view of God. I would say I'd be interested in having that discussion with you. Yeah, let's do it. You got a, you got a Book of Mormon with you? Uh, yes, I do. I can we look? Can we open it up? Sure. Please. Okay. 
If you could, do me a favor and go to Moroni chapter 8, verse 18. On the spot here, can I find it? You're doing great. Chapter one. You got it. Chapter 8, verse 18. And if you could, just read the verse out loud for the microphone. For I know that God is not a partial God, neither a changeable being, but he is a unchangeable from all eternity to all eternity. What do you think about that? I believe it. God, is, God doesn't change. Never has? Nope. Moroni 7.22. It's one page earlier, a couple pages earlier. One more page earlier. Moroni 7.22, first half of it anyway. For behold, God knowing all things, being from everlasting to everlasting. Okay, one more Book of Mormon passage for you. Mosiah 3.5. There you go. Three? Three, five. For behold, the time cometh and is not far distant that the power, the Lord omnipotent, who reigneth, who was and is from all eternity to all eternity, shall come down from the heaven among the children of men and shall dwell in a tabernacle of clay and shall go forth among okay. men. Yeah. So the first half was really interesting to me. First half says, the Lord God omnipotent, who was and is from all eternity to all eternity. Mm -hmm. Can you, you could probably guess, maybe you can, I don't know, tell me, do you have a sense of why I'm pointing these passages out to you? Uh, yeah, because you feel like the Book of Mormon teaches that God is contradicting itself. It's kind of what it sounds like to me. Well, at least that he's always been unchangeably God. Okay. Okay, so let me show you a quick, I'm sure you've seen this quite a few times. This is a quote from the King Fault Discourse. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea. Correct. So what it looks like what happened is in 1830, the Book of Mormon was published. It looks like the Mormons had a more Protestant-ish view of the nature of God and salvation. And uh, so, it, you know, when I read the Book of Mormon, I just, I just don't see much distinctive Mormonism in it mainstream or fundamentalist. Um, do you do you hold to DNC 20? Yes. An early one. You want to go to that one real quick? What verse? 17. And, by, and let's see. By these things we know that there is a God in heaven who is infinite and eternal from everlasting to everlasting, the same unchangeable God, the framer of heaven and earth and all things which are in them. Yeah. So infinite and eternal, this, from everlasting to everlasting, the same unchangeable God. Mm -hmm. Now I don't believe the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants are inspired of God, but I'll tell you some reasons why I think in terms of content, that's reflecting what the Bible already teaches. Can I just show you a Bible verse? Two Bible verses. Psalm 90 verse 2. Psalm? Psalms 90 verse 2. Plural, singular. Psalm, Psalm. For the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou shalt, ah, wind, thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And the last, the last one is Isaiah 44, I'm sorry, Isaiah 43, verse 10. All right. <clears throat> All right. Ye are my witness, saith the Lord, that my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he, 
for or see before me there was no god form neither shall there be after me so the part that really stands out to me is before me there was no god formed neither shall there be after me psalm 90 verse 2 is from everlasting to everlasting thou art god book of mormon the lord god omnipotent who was and is from all eternity to all eternity unchangeable from all eternity to all eternity dnc 20 infinite and eternal and from everlasting to everlasting, the same unchangeable God. So can you see why an evangelical born-again Christian like me out here, we read something like the King Fall Discourse. Right. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea, and I'm sure you're aware of him teaching in that same sermon. You've got to learn how to be gods, the same as all the gods have done before you. Correct. You see the problem there? Well, I see the list of scriptures you brought forth. Um, if you'll read... Um, with uh, an intent to learn through the Spirit of God, you'll actually be able to understand that there is an opportunity for all of us to become perfect, like the scriptures say that we can become perfect. Now, a perfect being, you can call that a joint heir with Christ, if you want to, you can call and it. And by perfect, I assume you mean not merely sinless and ever-increasing knowledge and power, but you're talking about a spirit father, a spirit mother who can have their own spirit children? Correct. And so in the scriptures, um, Matthew 5, 48, it talks, be, the, be therefore perfect even as your father in heaven is perfect. So if you're going to be a perfect being, then therefore I believe that you would have to be joint heirs with Jesus Christ or wh whoever God you want to call him that's up in heaven, that therefore you would be with them and therefore you would have the same opportunities as we, he would have up and continually increasing as is taught by our, our prophets. Can I show you the Matthew 5 passage and, and where, can we look through the context real quick? Sure. You need to get an iPad out here so we just be like boop 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 boop. <laughs> wouldn't it be quite the same I'm afraid. <laughs> we couldn't feel the pages it just wouldn't. <laughs> yep. Okay. So, Matthew 5, 48. Okay, so let's go down to um, 44. But, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despite you, despitefully use you, and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the, on the evil and on the good and sins reign on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them that, that love you, what reward have you? Do you not, do not even the publicans do the same? And if you salute your brothers, greet them only, what, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans do so? Be perfect, be therefore perfect, even as your Father is in heaven is imperfect. So what I would argue is that in context, God is saying, be like him and this is how god he sends rain on the just and the unjust we get rain osama bin laden gets rain mother Teresa gets rain your prophet gets rain you know god loves he has a special love for everyone and we see that through creation we see that through rain but god there is a kind of love that god has for all of humanity correct and and god in and, and matthew well, Jesus in Matthew is saying, be like that. And don't merely love people who, who are on your side, right? Don't, you're not, you know, even the hypocrites like to love people who love them. So, so be perfect in the sense of don't discriminate your love to people who will just love you back. I totally disagree with you, but I'd like to bring up, a, um, do you believe that there was anyone that has been perfect since Adam came down on the earth? Jesus. Okay. Morally speaking. Okay. Any anyone else? Um, well, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Ecclesiastes says there isn't a man who doesn't stumble. And James right. three says we all stumble in many ways. And I'm best. I'm get, betting that you're not one of those perfect guys. So. Oh no, <laughs> definitely not. Me either. I mean, I just want to point out. I mean. I don't want to get in a little Bible bash, you know, I don't believe in that, I don't believe there's a good spirit in it, but I feel like we're having a good conversation. And let's see, this is Genesis 6, um, 
here in verse 9, it's talking about Noah. And it says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. So it sounds like to me that there, there is an opportunity for all of us to be able to do what previous prophets has, have done. Do you remember after Noah got off the boat and how he got a little drunk? Yep, I remember that. You think that was a sin? <laughs> uh, well, it obviously was not the exact way an image of God would, would portray. But, you know, let's just say for the sake of argument that Noah was sinlessly perfect, right? In the Matthew, the Matthew passage that says, right. be there per perfect, mm -hmm. is that really a verse we can take to mean that, you know, become a most high God who's worshipped by billions of your own spirit children someday? Or in context, you know, if we were going to be kind of like careful and cautious about the way we read the text, would it not be more responsible for us to say, you know, in context, it's talking about not being discriminatory about how we give love to people, you know what I'm saying? Well, I believe Jesus Christ said what he meant and that we can become like him, which, like our Father in Heaven, which were perfect beings. That, and that's my how, what he means, how do you discern what someone means in the text? What's some basic things you do when you read a passage to discern the meaning? Well, I do what, what you did and read before and after, just kind of give an idea of, of what you're getting at. But you can't just do that. You gotta go and pray about it and find out for yourself how that means through the Spirit of our Father in Heaven. And, but we would both agree context is pretty key, right? Well, yeah, it definitely plays a part in helping us understand what the Scriptures mean. Got a question for you. Mm -hmm. When Paul says, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, you've heard that, right? The Spirit bears witness with our spirit. Right. I'm not using the KJV, if and if, you know, sorry. Right. What do you think that means? You know, probably the Spirit bears witness. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I'm sorry, I, this is a kind of a verse that a lot of mainstream Mormons hear, you know, okay. and I talk to them about it. I'm not sure if it's kind of a big part of your culture, though. N not really, but it sounds legitimate. Yeah. It's the same context as the passage about being joint heirs with Christ. So, can we go there? Romans 8? Uh, Romans 8. Which verse? Oh, um, I think it's 17. I'm, uh, no, it's 16. The Spirit itself bear, beareth witness unto our spirit that we are the children of God. So, given your worldview, and I'm sorry if this is unfair, but Given your background and your religious upbringing and your teachings, mm -hmm. at face value, what does that sound like to you? That we are God's children. Everyone? Right. Are all sons and daughters of God? Yeah, definitely. Everybody's sons and daughters of God. Even the people who live like the devil don't live by the Spirit? Correct. Okay, so I'm sorry. I am setting you up here, to be I honest with you. So. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is just a good good example of where context is so key. So I'll give you an example. I've got Mormon missionaries on my couch sometimes and I ask them, do you think this passage is talking about us being literal children of a heavenly father and heavenly mother? Or do you think this means that we can become adopted children by faith through Jesus to the father? And they usually will tell me, you can probably guess. That they are literal children, I'm yeah. sure, of course. That's yeah. what we believe. Okay, okay, so let's go a verse up. I'm sorry if I'm dragging this out. Um, well, I'll go to 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. So one observation I would make there is there's only one kind of people that's the sons of God in this sense that Paul's speaking of. Those who are led by the Spirit. It's flipped over there, sorry. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And the Spirit we have is not the Spirit of bondage, it's the Spirit of adoption. And by that Spirit of adoption, 
which only people who walk by the Spirit have, they have sonship. They, they are adopted sons and daughters of God through Jesus. Um, but yeah, let's, one more thing here. 17, and if children, and then context adopted children, then heirs, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ so that we may suffer. So if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Mm-hmm. Really interesting thing that ties into this issue. Did Jesus inherit Godhood? Did he inherit it? Well, in my, in our belief that he, being the son of God, I mean, our teaching is that he actually is a literal son of God and begot by Adam himself. And so um, I understand what you're saying here. Our teaching is, uh, is, a, is being that if you are adopted uh, son and daughter of God, you're ac- it's actually a little different than being the son of the literal son of God being of our flesh. So, and our teaching is that you can be a son of God and in the, in the priesthood, and you can be a son of God uh, in just being that you were born of his, his spirit and of the flesh. You know, there's a verse that's real famous, John 1, 1. I could just quote it to you. It says, mm-hmm. in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus is the word. And in the beginning, he's with God and he is God. And he goes on to say the word became flesh. So biblically, and I would even say, um, well, I'll just say biblically, Jesus from the very beginning is God. His Godhood isn't something he had to achieve or sort of over time inherit. It was part of his very, very being. Um, Yeah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So Jesus, in the very beginning, is with the Father. As God, they're in full relationship from the very beginning. They never had to form a relationship or shake hands or initiate some sort of relationship. They were always in relationship. So it doesn't. I agree with that. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. Do you think the? Um, I'm assuming though that, correct me if I'm wrong, that in your, your religion, there's a heavenly grandfather. There is, yep. And. Um, and he had a father, and he had a father, and on back into infinity. Bring him like the infinite regression, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, the father had to beget Jesus as a spirit son, right? Correct. So was there not in time a beginning to their relationship? Right. So were they always in full relationship? Well, according to that line of thinking, that there had to be a starting point. Um, explain. Well, um, when it talks about God, being of days, end of days, and all that that goes on, that... Um, are you familiar with the LDS and their elders, priests, teachers, deacons, um, prophets, and all that? There are priesthood offices. Well, in the heavens, there's also offices in which they hold. And one of them is a Christ. One of them is, is an Adam. One of them is um, Michael. So the priesthood, if I could... Sorry to be rude. I'm, I'm just... a. I'm, um, I'm going to assume here that for you, the correct me if I'm wrong, the office is eternal, mm-hmm. but his position in that office had a beginning. That- correct. Okay. Would you say that our God, our Heavenly Father, is literally the first God? That our God? No. Okay. Can I set you up for something? Can I set you up for another Isaiah passage? <laughs> if you want, I don't know it's going to accomplish anything. <laughs> Let's check out Isaiah 44. This has been interesting. I'm, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> By the way, when I've gone through Book of Mormon verses with Mormons, I've never had anyone accuse me of Book of Mormon bashing. <laughs> uh, no? 
Oh, geez. Uh, why not? But when I talk about the Bible, it's just something different ball game, I guess. Okay, it doesn't rhyme. <laughs> no alliteration there. <laughs> Verses 6 and 8 in chapter 44. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And he says in verse 8, Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. So it's, it's really interesting because we've got these, these just theme in Isaiah. Before me no God was formed, neither shall there be after me. I'm the first, I'm the last. Besides me there is no God. Is there a God beside me? Yea, I know of no, you know, there is no God. I know of none other. And he says things like, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will give my glory to no other. Um, he says things like, I am God, there's none like me. I am God and there's none other. And then in chapter 48, um, if I remember correctly, verse 9, and this really gives us a sense of just how ultimate he is. He says, for my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you that I may not cut you off. And he says two verses later, for my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should I let my name be profaned? I, I, my glory I will not give to another. Okay. What does that sound like? Just face value to you. Just. I had to study through it to kind of to figure out what. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, would you agree with me though that in Mormonism, including your your religious um, branch? I'm sorry, I don't know to call it. Uh, right. What would you call it? Church of Jesus Christ. Okay, in your church, <laughs> would you agree that the purpose of your God is to share all of His glory? with everyone as much as he can in the sense that he wants to help others have all the knowledge, power, and dominion. He wants to help others become gods and have their own spirit children. Is that, is that agreeable? Right. I, that, that your church teaches that? It does. They, we're, we're striving to be joint heirs of Jesus Christ. If you went back to the other passage that we were reading in the Bible, it said exactly that. We were to be joint heirs of Jesus Christ. And for you, I'm, I assume that means becoming gods and being worshipped someday. No, I wouldn't say I would be worshipped. Would you have your own spirit kids? Yes. I, I mean, I would strive to. I mean, I don't know if that's going to happen yet, but that's something I'm striving for. Will they relate to you the same way you relate to your Heavenly Father? Uh, that's something I don't know. But I'm, So I they would, could worship you. It's potential. I, would, I wouldn't say worship, but I would say... Um, so is this generation of the gods pretty special? Is you, your next generation of the gods very different? or? No, they're all the same. So if they're all the same, if you have your own spirit children, what's to stop you from believing that potentially someday you're going to be receiving the same kind of worship that your Heavenly Father receives from your own spirit children? Well, I suppose that's possible. I mean, it seems pretty cut and dry to me. I, I know I don't want to force that, like, this is what Jared always thinks about, but, right. but it seems like a pretty logical extension of Brigham's theology that there's this infinite regression of gods and each god has his own spirit children who learn to worship and pray to him the same as all the other gods worship their heavenly fathers. Well, there is never an ending to one's learning. We're always learning, we're always growing. Do you agree with that? We don't ever stop. There's never... I don't think God learns, but I totally agree about people go to heaven. Oh yeah, man. The library of God's knowledge, never going to be exhausted. Okay, so um, in our religion we teach we have a pre-existence, so we were created both spiritually and then physically. And so as we, as we continually learn from the pre-existence to our mortal existence to our post-mortal existence, we're always going to be um, striving. I mean, if, if you're in that mode, I guess, some people may not want to learn, but as long as you have a desire to continue to learn, we're always going to be able to keep taking steps forward and to learn and to grow and to keep, keep moving forward until we get to uh, a point um, where we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And then, even then, I still believe there actually is still a continuation. There's still an ever-expanding... Right, Brigham believed the gods are always progressing in all of their attributes, correct? Correct. So, even our father, you would say, 
is it fair to say that he's still learning and growing in power and knowledge? Right. Right. So, but back to that issue of being worshipped someday. Does it not seem like a logical? I mean, it doesn't sound like you're denying it, but it doesn't sound like you're affirming it. Do you I, think it's a? Honestly, I never thought about it before like that. So fair I enough. I don't really know what to say. Okay. So, what would you say? I would say I'll give you two answers to that. One is, and on if I consider the logic of Mormonism, mm-hmm. someday literally you will have billions of your own spirit children mm-hmm. bowing down to you. Holy, holy, holy is Jared Almighty. <laughs> you laugh, you laugh. Remember that, dude. You laughed. It is silly, isn't it? No, it's wow. totally silly to think you could ever be worshipped. But remember that they would bow down and worship you and say, Holy, holy, holy is Jared Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Jared's the most high God. Besides him, there is no God. Before him, there is no God form. Neither shall there be any after him. Jared was unchangeably God from all eternity to all eternity. Makes you feel a little uncomfortable, doesn't it? But do people have pray to you and have asking you to solve their problem of evil and, and, and asking you to help them become gods, but worshiping and singing to you... Well, um, the way I, the way the, the spirit's telling me, and the way I feel about that is that um, being joint heirs of Jesus Christ, let's say, we're all with Him, we're all serving with Him, serving Him, if you would, in the celestial kingdom. Now, if I have children. There's a certain line that if I have someone that is wants to learn something that maybe doesn't some, know something that, that I know at that time, yeah, I can help them. But that when, they're, when I have spirit children, let's say, they're not going to be serving me because all the glory that we receive always gets passed on to the person that we are serving. The person that we are glorifying. So is all the glory you're giving to your Heavenly Father getting passed to your Heavenly Grandfather? Mm-hmm. On up the line into eternity. So is your God getting all the glory? He receives glory, but then He gives it. So He kind of redirects it up, upward? Yep. All, a never-ending line or, or whatever you would say. Because to, um, for me to just receive that myself, that would be a, an end of that, it wouldn't go anywhere. But if it, as long as it, uh, so would you re- you would receive worship like your heavenly Father receives worship, i.e., in such a way that you receive it initially, but then redirect it upward to another God above you. <laughs> well, I don't think it. I re- I wouldn't say I receive it. I would just say that glory just flows through. But I mean, you'd have spirit children singing praises to you, right? Uh, Conceivably. No, I don't, I don't, well, they would pray to Father in Heaven. Which, which would be you, right? Um, I don't, no, I don't think I would be the Father in Heaven. I would just be joint heirs with Father in Heaven. So it doesn't they, sound like Brigham's view, does it? Brigham sounds, you know, the way Brigham teaches it, it's an infinite regression of gods. Each planet has its own God, you know, um, or, the, you know, each God has his own worlds, I should say. And his spirit children relate to him in the same way that he relates to his, any God relates to his Heavenly Father. Hey, I, let me just say this up front. I don't want to play games with you. Right. It sounds like you haven't considered fully the logical implications of Brigham Young's theology, let alone Joseph Smith's theology. I mean, really, mainstream Mormonism as we have it today is sort of through the expansions of Brigham Young, sort of retracted partially, but, um, but, but think... Out the window. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, you know, I've laughed about it a little bit, it's, yeah. but it's pretty serious. I'm trying to be friendly with you, but right. so two things I'd say to you. One is you haven't really, I think more about the implications of, of Brigham Young's theology, i.e. you will be worshipped someday called the Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. You know, you'll be known as their most high God. The second thing I'd say to you is that biblically that's blasphemy and that's idolatry. And it's, it's a thing that alienates you from God. It's, it's, it's like in Deuteronomy 13 where, where it says, you know, if a prophet comes and does many signs and wonders, but he leads you after false gods, you know, and under Israelite law, you put him to death. He's a false prophet. Don't fear him. Don't worry about him. Sayonara. 
bye bye dude or whatever, however you say it. He, he's right. gone. He's he's dead. Um, but the way the Bible speaks about God literally is the most high God, not just the more high, relatively high, but literally the most high God. And he says, before me, no gods were formed, neither shall there be after me. He says, I'm the first and the last. He says, uh, my glory I will not give to another. This is a really odd thing for, I think, Mormons to hear from the Bible is that, or, or a really cool passage in Romans 11, verses 33 to 36, it says, who has known the mind of a Lord? Who has been his counselor? How unsearchable are his judgments? How inscrutable are his ways? Who has ever given God a gift that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever, amen. Those are all rhetorical questions from Paul, but Mormonism tries to answer those questions by saying, you know, who has ever known the mind of a Lord? Well, there's countless gods who can fully know him the mind of the Lord. Who has ever given a God, a, given God a gift that he might be repaid? Well, there's a God above our God who gave him gifts to help him to be who he is today. Who is, uh, are, his, are his judgments unsearchable? Well, no, someday you'll, you'll learn everything he knows today. Um, are all, literally all, everything good, true, and beautiful is everything from God. Well, Mormonism has to say, no, there's this eternal law, a sort of is overall the genealogy of all the gods and you can't really attribute it to you know this ultimate personal being and um, not all the glory remember Romans 11 for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever so the the message of the Bible is that this God is the most high best none better God and he's doing what he's doing for his own glory. And the way that fleshes itself out with our purpose in life and salvation mm -hmm. is that our purpose in life, I, I preach a lot and these kids, when they hear me say, you can't become gods, they're like, well then what's the purpose of life? And it's a great question. It's, it's to worship God. It's to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, to be in relationship with him. So who would you, I mean, I know the LD, I know who the LDS believes God is. I know who I believe it. Who would you believe God is? He is all powerful. He's all knowing. Um, he is literally the top God. Um, none above him, none beside him. Um, he loves his creation. He didn't create the world out of any sort of need, but just out of an overflow of, of love, wanting to uh, have creatures that enjoy him and worship him um, gladly. And uh, he's perfect in everything. Everything about his past, present, and future, utterly, is worthy of worship and adoration. And so what? What is he? He's God. He's sort of self-defining. Uh, Moses says, who shall I say sent me? And he just says, I am that I am. He's the self-existing one. Everything else owes its existence to God. God alone is self-existing. Well, it also says in... Um I think it's John 17, 3. It says, this is life eternal. I'll know to know God. Something like that. Know God. To know, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Right. So we're supposed to literally know who God is. And to me, I need to do everything in my power while I'm here on the earth to create a relationship with my Father in heaven, which I believe is my literal Father in heaven, and so when I find, learn new information as I go through life and as I'm learning, that's going to help me be able to, to have life eternal. Which ultimately for you, I assume, con it, eventually, it eventually is, comes to Godhood for you, right? Well, hopefully. I mean, I don't know that for sure, but that's a strive. That's what I'm striving for in my life. So I got a challenge for you, Jared. Fair enough. Okay, here's my challenge. Take a fresh look at, let's say, the Gospel of John or Romans, just either one of those two, or both if you're really feeling <laughs> ambitious, um, and read it with this in mind. Um, and I'm going to make some claims and just test these claims. This most high God who does everything for his own glory, who wants to... Um, have us enjoy him in relationship, but literally he's infinite. 
we could spend eternity learning and growing in power and knowledge and we're never going to reach what he is because he's infinite and we're finite the and here's what I, and I challenge the purpose of salvation biblically is to redeem us for from the power and the guilt of sin so that we can give him all the glory so that we can boast not in ourselves not so that we can someday be worshipped, but so that we can boast in Him alone, worship Him alone. In other words, so that He gets all the credit and we get none of it. And I'll just give you, I'm sure you've heard this before. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Maybe, maybe not. Four by... I probably read it, but I couldn't quote it. It's all good. You, <laughs> you'll probably find it familiar. Cause okay. You appear, okay. For by grace we have been saved through faith. It's not of, not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's not by works, not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. Why? So that no man can boast. So I would, I would challenge you to read through Gospel of John or Romans and ask yourself, is salvation designed so that someday you can prove yourself worthy? Or is it really designed so that you can have an immediate gift, a humbling gift of free forgiveness and eternal life so that you can spend eternity giving God all the glory, just one most high God. So I'd encourage you to test it. The Bible says to test the spirits, to test prophets, mm -hmm. yeah. test them according to what scripture yeah. says. So yeah, I'll let you have the last word, Jared. I really appreciate talking with me. All I would say is anyone that's searching for truth, I guarantee you, if you have a heart that's sincere and you want to know fully it says uh, the most popular scripture uh, that um, in James that um, Joseph Smith read before he went to see the vision is that if any of you lack wisdom, let him act of, ask of God. And if you do that with a sincere heart, God will let it known unto you any truth that you want to know. Thanks a lot, Jared. Hope I hope you feel like I've been fair with you. <laughs> yeah, your name? Yeah, it was a good time. Okay. Appreciate it. Enjoyable talking with I bet you don't get to talk to many uh, born again Christian crazy street preacher guys out here very often, do you? Uh, no, that's my first time. Yeah? <laughs> you should, where, do you, where do you live? What's the general area? In Nevada. All the way from Nevada up to here to the Bantai pageant. Yep, I've been driving on the road for seven days. Not just in Nevada, we swung through <laughs> Texas on the way here. Wow. So. Yeah. We're preaching the gospel, spreading the word. Well, thanks for talking with me, dude. Jared, Thank you. take care. God bless. God bless.